Thanks, Thanks brother. Love you. Appreciate you. Well, let's, uh, let's give Jesus a bigger hand clap. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You know, I was just, um, man, this worship this morning was just awesome. And um, I, we were, I, we were there worshiping, and I was just thanking God for all that he's done in our lives. And, um, you know, I didn't have a great upline spiritually. And... You know, God, by his grace, brought, you know, came to me and brought, you know, saved me and filled me with the spirit, gave me a wonderful wife. Here's my beautiful bride, Janice, down here. Um, I've got four children, 12 grandchildren, and um, um, my granddaughter is coming to Karis this, this fall. She's right here, Hannah. Why don't you stand up, Hannah? I'm going to embarrass her. But this is Hannah, my granddaughter. Amen. Give her some love. Praise the Lord. And, uh, you know, what, what an honor it is, you know, that you, that you uh, follow the Lord and then and your family is following Jesus. There's just, there's just nothing better, guys. I, <laughs> it's just awesome. And then, and then you play this video of the folks that are in Nepal. They came out of our church and came to Karis. And it went to Nepal. Isn't that awesome? Man, it just doesn't get any better than, than that. Praise God. That's awesome. I, I, I've got a word for someone here today, though, who's in the valley of decision, uh, specifically about Karis. And I'm going to give you a word that God gave to me through my pastor, Bob Nichols. The pieces don't fit until you commit. You're, you're, you're not going to, you can't be dependent upon, well, if I get a job, if I find the housing, if, I, if all the stars line up, if everything is perfect, well, then, you know, then I'll commit. To, no, it doesn't work that way. You, you, you've, if God's brought you here, put a desire in your heart to come to Karis, and I've never met, met a student that's come to Karis that regretted it later. And, and if God's put that in your heart, what he's got to have from you is faith. If he's put it in your heart, you know you're supposed to be here. The pieces aren't going to fit until you commit. And so you commit. You take the step, and then things line up for you. And I know I'm talking to somebody, and I'm, this is not manipulation. This is just... You know, we want, if you're supposed to be here, we want you here, but, uh, you know, you can't push a rope. God's got to have something to work with, and he's going to have to, he's got to have your commitment uh, to work with today. Amen? Okay, I have some product somewhere under here. Let me grab it, and okay. They moved it all around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I've got, I'm, uh, is Matt here? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this product is only for uh, incoming students, okay? So if you're already a student, this isn't for you. So this is, uh, uh, this is, um, this is my book, uh, Your Healing Door, and uh, I'm gonna have you do this all, all together, okay? So this is your, your this is about, uh, how you can receive healing. It only takes one revelation of healing to open a healing door for you. So all it takes is one word, and, and, this, and I've got 12 different keys that will unlock healing doors for you. This is a, uh, my book, A Prosperous Soul. I'm gonna be teaching out of it this morning. Um, it, it's a complimentary teaching to Andrew's teaching, Spirit, Soul, and Body. It's, it's when Christians have problems they're soul problems. Okay, your spirit's righteous, holy, pure. But, if, but people's souls are messed up. And, and if your soul, if you, get, if, you, if you get your soul prospering, aligned with your spirit, then you're going to walk in dominion and, and somebody needs this book. And then this is my book, Flowing in the Supernatural. 
Okay, uh, it, I, I, we, we, uh, in our church, we had the supernatural, we had the word, and we had the spirit, and we had things in order. So if, if you desire to flow in the supernatural, this is for you. This is my latest book, Walking in Wisdom. This generation, not that I'm not speaking this over the church, but this generation is information rich and wisdom poor. I mean, you can Google anything. <laughs> my, my seven-year-old grandson, Riker, he's a cool little dude. He said, he said, pop up. He said, are you famous? <laughs> of course, on Andrew's platform, I am, you know. And, uh, and I said, I don't know, son. He said, well, I Googled you the other day. Because <laughs> my name is M-O-H-R and I'm the first one that comes up. It's, anyway, you can find me on Google. <laughs> But, but we need wisdom, guys. We, we got all this knowledge available to us at our fingertips, but we need wisdom, and, and this will be a good book. Now, I'm also on television, thanks to Andrew's ministry on gospeltruth.tv. I have a, a show called Li uh, Wisdom for Living, and uh, this is a great uh, TV series here called Navigating the Storms of Life, and it's powerful. And then uh, Enemies of Prosperity, uh, you, this, is, this will help you, uh, you know, not only receive prosperity, but be a blessing to others. And I have a Campus Days special today. Anybody that buys one of my TV series will get a book free. So uh, give this to, only lift your hand if you're an incoming CARE student, okay? Or you're, you're a visitor, but you're, you're gonna, not going to be a visitor long. All right. Open your Bibles wherever you'd like. I'm going to, uh, where am I going to be? <laughs> I'm going to be in Psalm 139. Psalm 139. <laughs> you want me to tell you a funny? I'm going to tell you the first funny that I ever told, and I heard Peter Wagner share this, and I, and I, People ask, well, why, do, why do you do these? Why? Well, when I was pastoring, I shared this, the funny I'm going to share with you right now. And there were two men that their wives had been praying for them that came to church. And one of them got saved. One of them came back to the Lord. They both went home independent of each other and said, told their wives, we're going, I'm going to come back. That guy's funny. <laughs> and I said, well, man, if that'll hook people, I'm going to, so I just got to tell them funnies anyway. Uh, so you can go on my website, gregmore.com, and you can see funnies. Okay, and some good content. Okay, this is called the wrong email address. So a Minneapolis couple decided to go to Florida to thaw out during a particularly icy winter. They planned to stay at the same hotel where they spent their honeymoon 20 years earlier. Because of their hectic schedules, it was difficult to coordinate their travel. So the husband left Minnesota and flew to Florida on Thursday with his wife flying down the following day. The husband checked into the hotel and there was a computer in his room. So he decided to send an email to his wife. However, he accidentally left out one letter in her email address and without realizing his error, sent the email. Meanwhile, somewhere in Houston, a widow had just returned home from her husband's funeral. He was a minister, was called home to glory following a heart attack. And the widow decided to check her email, expecting messages from relatives and friends. And after reading the first message, she screamed and fainted. The widow's son rushed into the room, found his mother on the floor, and saw the computer screen which read, <clears throat> Sub to my loving wife, subject, I've arrived. <laughs> the 
I know you're surprised to hear from me. They have computers here now. And you're allowed to send emails to your loved ones. I've just arrived and have been checked in. And I've seen that everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you then. Hope your journey is as uneventful as mine was. P.S. Sure is hot down here. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I don't care who you are there. That's, <laughs> that is funny. Oh, praise God. <laughs> and that is how it all began. My funnies, that is. All right, Psalm 139, verse 13. I'm still crying here. <laughs> For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And here, God's telling us things about us that we're fearfully and wonderfully made, that we're marvelous, a marvelous creation of God. Um, we were made, in, we were made, skill, we were skillfully wrought. Uh, God did not make a mistake with you or me when he created us. And the Bible talks about this in 3 John 2, beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And guys, here he said, he wants your soul to know this very well. If your soul doesn't know these truths well, your soul is not going to prosper and the things that are in your spirit will not be released. You will be covering what's in your, in your spirit you know, with, with your soul. When Jesus, when Jesus in, in, in Revelation 3.20 said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens the door, I'll come into him, sup with him, he with me. He was writing that, he, he's speaking that to the church. How could he be talking to the church who is born again, who is righteous in their spirit? Uh, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. How could Jesus be on the outside looking in? He's not. He's on the inside looking in and saying, would you open the door to your soul? Would you, would you open up fully every every area of your life and let me come in and have have your way have my way see he's not in control of our will and our soul consists of our mind mind will and emotions and he's he wants to he wants to dominate every area of of your soul and 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 it to the degree that you yield your will your mind and emotions to the lord to that degree you'll prosper are you hearing me? Yes. To that degree, you'll walk consistently in health. You'll walk consistently in prosperity. Now, God will get healing and prosperity to you when you're messed up. But the bottom line is, if you want to walk in consistently where the en enemy isn't eating your lunch and popping the bag, like Andrew talks about, then, you know, what, what does Andrew mean when he says, don't let the enemy eat your lunch and pop the bag? Well, I could come down and Give my mic and Andrew could tell you, but, but he's, he don't give place to the devil. And where do we give place to the devil? It's in our souls. 
And one of the main things that we need to, our souls need to prosper in is we need to know very well who we are. Yes? And so I'm, you know, I, this is one of, the, one of the courses I teach here. It's one of the classes I teach is just knowing your identity very well. And, and you can't, you guys, you cannot get past the need of knowing your identity very well. A prosperous soul knows and agrees with these facts. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Say that, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm a marvelous creation of God. My father created me with skillful hands and care. He did not make a mistake with me. And this my soul knows very well. Many Christians do not agree, do not know or agree with who they are. And, and as a result, their, their souls aren't prospering. I didn't know who I was. I was a six foot two, size 12 shoe, a hundred and nothing pounds in the, in the seventh grade. And I was all arms and legs. I played basketball, but I was very uncoordinated. And so they called me spider. <laughs> and <laughs> one of the, and my, my parents divorced when I was eight years old. My dad uh, wasn't around. My mom moved us from Iowa to, to Houston, Texas. And so my dad wasn't there. And uh, the, the, the Bible talks about the glory of their ch glory of children are their fathers. And, and uh, so I, my, my identity was messed up. I, uh, my dad promised to come take us to the circus, to different places. He didn't show up. And, and I began to agree with a lie that I was not worthy because I wasn't worth my dad's time. And then when I was in the um, seventh or eighth grade, you know, back then it wasn't cool for guys to be cheerleaders, but they were voting for cheerleaders. And so some, some friend, supposed friend of mine, he, he put up, he, he put uh, banners all over and posters all over, vote for Spider for cheerleader. Of course, he, he got some of my five-fold ministry. Uh, <laughs> this is before I was saved. But I had a big nose. To, you know, I just, I, God made a mistake. I wasn't coordinated. I wasn't in the in crowd. I wasn't, you know, cool. I, I didn't, I wasn't the, you know, I wasn't anything. I thought, right? Well, wrong, <laughs> but, I, but that's, that's how I felt. My soul didn't know who I was and therefore, you know, man, I, I, tried, to, I, tried, to do, I tried to do all kinds of things to bolster my identity. You know, I tried to work out, I tried to, you know, try it out for the football team and I, you know, was second string and, you know, and so I felt second class, and and um, I, I've got new. I've got another word for someone today. You feel you feel second class. God's giving you an upgrade today. You're first class. But I didn't know. I thought God made a mistake with me. Did, is anyone? Is it? Can anybody identify with that? That 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 you know. But many Christians they don't they don't agree like me. And like I didn't, and, and this fact is borne out in a multitude of ways that we attempt to bolster our identity. And, and that's what I was trying to do, being obsessive about your appearance. Over the top makeup or makeover. You know, I'm not against makeup. I mean, you know, <laughs> Kenneth Hagin used to say, you know, any old barn can use a little paint, you know, <laughs> so. I'll leave that and go on, move on. But you know, over the top makeup, hair, hairdo, hair club for men, that would, if I had hair, that would make me more valuable, right? Um, you know, wor working out, 
a lifetime tanning bed membership. That's, the, that's gonna make me valuable. You know, or wearing some brand clothes, you know, or you know, back, back in my day, it was Converse tennis shoes and, and now they've come back and, and, you know, but I mean, being obsessive about wearing some, you know, wearing some kind of, you know, name brand clothes or, or have, being, having some status symbol like an expensive car or, or a house in a ritzy neighborhood or, or, you know, you try to bolster your identity by name dropping, getting a picture with Andrew and, and, and putting it all over your ha- and you know, send on Facebook and, and, and I know I know Andrew Womack, you know. And that and and you know, that's fine. It's great to know Andrew. Uh, but is that the reason why? Is that gonna make you more valuable? Is that gonna add to your value? These are all all performance based attempts to bolster your identity that are born out of insecurity. Yes? And this is a soul that doesn't know his own identity very well. This is an individual who's playing the part of an orphan. When all the time he's a son with the father's genes, I'm not talking about pants you wear, and, and his inheritance, and you, you, and, and you become a do-to-be instead of a be-to-do. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not a do-to-be. You know, where your identity is wrapped up in what you do instead of who you are. Now, I don't know, can you guys put this up on the screen now? I don't know if they can get it up there. Is it up? Yes, no. Still not up? Okay, there's three distinct identity mindsets, okay? And um, I, have, I have three great slides, but. <laughs> Let's see if. Let's see if we can get it now. Is it coming up? If it doesn't, I'll just quote them. No? All right. Let's, uh, let's move on. Everybody thank God for the, for the AV team. Awesome. I'll buy you lunch, sir. There's three distinct identity mindsets Orphans, slaves, and sons, okay? And orphans have experienced abandonment by their parents. Um, they, they're, they, they're never sure they belong. Uh, they're suspicious. You may want to take a picture of this. That would be great. You can do it. It's copyrighted. You're right to copy They're never sure they belong. They're suspicious about others' commitments to them. They don't trust people in authority. They have a history of pain and broken relationships. They're quick to hurt others before they're hurt. They expect to be rejected. And they find it difficult to commit to jobs, career, relationships, marriage, ministry, like Cain, they, they wander through life with no sense of purpose and direction when all, when all the time, uh, John 14, 18, Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I will not leave you orphans. Have any of you ever been in one of those places? Then slaves, they... Slaves feel that they have no permanent place in the family. They feel in and out with God. They have no, they, they have food and lodging. Sometimes they're cared for, but they have no owner. They have no ownership. John 8, 35 says, a slave does not abide in the house forever. 
but a son abides forever. So he, he, he you know, he, he has his needs met. It was like the prodigal that was going to come back and I'll just, you know, I'll just live out there with the slaves, but, but it has no ownership. Uh, I, their identity is based on what they do for God. They always try to impress others and always try to make a name for themselves. They're, they manipulate their way, they try to manipulate their way into appointments with Andrew and other important people because they don't feel good about themselves. And they're trying to hitch, hook their wagon to somebody else's identity and, and to that person's platform when all that you need to understand, guys, God doesn't have any grandchildren. Amen. He, only has, he only has sons. And, and they work constantly working for the attention of dad and unsure of, of his love as, as we, we saw in the, in the, in the video that, that we, we saw earlier with that young man. Um, then the basis of their, for their standing in the family is their performance. And, and yet, the, the, the Bible says in Galatians 4, 7, let me just turn there. Galatians 4 and verse 7, it says, Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. Yes? Then, then you have sons. They know they're loved. They're secure in their role in the family. They know they're redeemed. They know they're heirs and joint heirs with Christ. I, there's a lot of other things I could add here. They're not jealous of success of their brothers. In fact, they, they celebrate others' promotion in the kingdom. And they're not jealous. They're not envious. They're, they, they rejoice in, in others' promotion. They, they know because they know all that the Father has is theirs, and they don't have to work or perform for it. And in Galatians 4, 7 again, it says, therefore you are no longer a slave, you're no longer a slave, but a son. Then, uh, and then an heir of God through Christ. Everybody say, I'm not an orphan. I'm not a slave. I'm a son of God. As Pastor Rick McFarland says, okay, to all the, all the ladies, if I can be the bride of Christ, you can be a son of God. Amen. Nick that off of Pastor Rick. And Janice and I attend their church. They've got a great church. Praise God. So, God, I, I'm, you know, there's a story about Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was an orphan. He was brought up as an orphan in an orphanage. He was, they called him incorrigible. That's not a good word. If you look up incorrigible, it just means he was a troublemaker. They, they expected trouble from him. He was, you know, and he was, a, he was kind of large. He was, a, he was a bully. He was always trying to, you know, he was, but he was causing trouble because he was wanting attention. Okay, and he, they finally found something he could do and hit a baseball. And, and guys, even into his adulthood, it's reported that Babe Ruth slept with his bat. But he had, a, he had for, I don't know about his entire life and whether he got free or not, but, there, but for a long, large portion of his life, his identity was wrapped up in what he did. That's why many athletes, uh, professional athletes, they crater, they fail, they fall after they, they, you know, I mean, you can think about it, man. Most professional athletes can't, can't uh, perform like they did after 35 years old. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's problematic if you're 34, <laughs> like me. <laughs> hey, Amen. Okay, you guys can, you guys can uh, take, well, I'll just leave that up. Okay, Proverbs 17, 6 says, the glory of children is their father. 
And we receive our identity from our, either from our natural fathers, our spiritual fathers, but especially our heavenly father. And until I learned to receive my identity from the latter two fathers, I lived a performance-driven life. I was constantly seeking approval from my dad. When I was in my 20s, um, I, I was a very successful businessman. I, I mean, I was, had an entre entrepreneurial uh, uh, you know, gift, and I, I mean, I started several businesses. Man, I mean, I, I made a lot of money in Houston, Texas with a wholesale florist business. And I, I mean, I used, to, I used to keep stacks of $100 bills in, in, in a safe deposit box. And I would, my security was on Monday mornings, I would go add to the stack and, and, and count the $100 bills. That's great, isn't it? <laughs> now I'm believing people ask me all the time, what do you believe, what, what, how can I help you? What can I help you with, Pastor Greg? You know, when I'm teaching or whatever, I just tell them I'm just, just looking for a sack of $100 bills. But no, I'm not, I, it's not for me. I give them away. And I, everywhere I go, people give me $100 bills. And I, don't anybody do this because I'm telling But I, I give away because I'm, now I had those $100 bills stacked in my safe deposit box out of fear and out of, it was, and I was my identity wrapped up in, how much I had, and, and, and now I live to give them away. And I just love it, man. Given, I, we go to church churches and I give pastor's kids a $100 bill. Man, it's like, whoa, and I, and I tell them, thank you for letting your parents follow the Lord. And man, God sees the sacrifices you're making. Man, you know, just, it's awesome, isn't it? Just giving, you all just believe God with me for that sack of $100 bills, amen? But, but I, di I didn't know my identity. And, and, and the Lord had to show me. I lived under a spirit of rejection. I, was, I had an orphan mentality. And, and, and even after I was born again and filled with the spirit, and I was, it was like, if, if you didn't, you know, if Mike and Carrie didn't invite me to their, you know, anniversary party or Mike's birthday party, and, and then I, or, or Daniel didn't invite me, then I'm, I'm going to smile on the outside, but I'm going to be, devastated on the inside because I lived under this spirit of rejection. I expected to be rejected and, and it was like, man, God, something's wrong with this picture. And God had to show me that I was trying to perform and I was, and, and I was obsessed with success, hoping that my dad would one day come and watch me perform. And I finally had to repent of that. God showed me and you know, I was living in a performance-driven life. God, you, that I am not an orphan. I am not a slave. And, and what, whether my dad ever comes to my, to my game or my, my performance, I, I am a son of God and I am loved by God. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm skillfully wrought. God, God did not make a mistake with me if my dad never approves me. Or if your dad never approved you. I'm, I'm a son of God. And, and, I, and I had to repent of all of that and say, God, I, I, I am fearfully wonderful. Would you make, help me make, make that real in my soul? Are you hearing me? A good father will really help his son or daughter find their security in who they are more than in what they do. Now, Jesus ministered from a place of security in his identity. Look at Matthew 3, verse 17. Matthew 3. And, and this is right before Jesus' temptation. And suddenly, verse 17, and suddenly a voice came from heaven and said, saying, this is my beloved son in whom, this is right after he was baptized, in whom I'm well pleased. Listen, this was before Jesus did any miracle, before he fulfilled anything, anything of the call of God on his life. Uh, the, the, he, he, had this, I, he had this knowing, I am loved by my father. I'm accepted by my father. Are, are you hearing me? And he had not done one miracle, fulfilled any aspect of his ass ministry assignment. The father's pleasure in him was not performance-based, but relationship-based. 
And the first 10, notice now in chapter four, the first temptations by Satan to Jesus were in the area of his identity. In, in, verse, uh, in verse three, now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you're the son of God, what did, what did God just speak to Jesus? He said, and which he knew that anyway, but he said, you, you know, you're my beloved son in whom I'm well, in whom I'm well pleased. And, and here the enemy comes and says, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, do something to prove it. Get into performance. You got to prove this thing. What, what, did, what did Jesus say? He said, man shall, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the Father. He, he was living on, out of the word that the Father had spoke, spoken over him. Yes? And then he refused to be drawn into that because he was secure in his identity and the father, his Father's love for him. He had a confident relationship with the Father that was not based on performance or approval of men. Um, verse 6 the same thing, the enemy came back to him. If you're the son of God. Guys, this wasn't a temptation over food and it wasn't over an overpower and authority as much as it was over his identity. Are you hearing me? And you know what? He had a prosperous soul because of that. Now I want you to look at Matthew 13. I have the airport in sight and we will land soon if you get this. If you don't get it, we'll just circle around. <laughs> I want to read from Matthew 13, two parables, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Two, two parables. The first one, a man found treasure and he hid it. And for joy over it, he goes and sells everything he has. He liquidates everything he has to buy the field so he can get the treasure. And he, perch, he considers the purchase worth the sacrifice compared to like, it's like in Texas when, uh, if you bought land, if you, if you own the mineral rights to the land that you're buying, under the, underground is, more, is worth, worth more than on top of the ground. Yeah. If you're in Texas or, or in Oklahoma or some, some place where there's actually, you know, oil or gas, then I'm, you know, you own the, own the mineral rights, you are, under, underground is more valuable than, than what, what you're buying on, on top, yes? And that's what this is. He, he, this person saw the field, saw, he saw the treasure, and, and went and sold everything he had to buy the field and, and per, you know, like he's purchasing the mineral rights. Then in verse 45 and 46, a pearl merchant was seeking beautiful pearls. And finding one pearl of great value, he took action and he sold he sold all that he had, he liquidated so that he could purchase uh, that one pearl. And both the man and the merchant do the math and determine that the value of the treasure and the value of the pearl is worth whatever it costs them to liquidate. Are, are y'all with me? Both of them also approach the exchange as trading up. Okay, in value. And we've been taught for years that Jesus is the pearl of great price. And certainly he is. He's worth more than anything that we could, that we could receive in life. Only one problem with that analogy. <laughs> you and I didn't have, and, we, and like we were, all we, we have to sell all, so we can, we can receive Jesus. Only one problem with that analogy, you and I don't have enough to liquidate, to receive Jesus. And certainly I know you could, you, you could say that you're given, you know, you're totally surrendering your will. And, and so that's, you know, that will, but 
I want you to think about this from another standpoint, that you're the treasure and you're the pearl. And Jesus is the man and the merchant. Are you hearing me? Jesus is both the man and the merchant. You and I are the treasure and the pearl. When Jesus looks at us, he sees both value and beauty. And now it's hidden. It's hidden. Jesus sees something that others don't see, including ourselves, value and beauty. It takes revelation for us to see our value in him. You know why? Because, second, because uh, we, we're, we're, we know ourselves too well after the flesh. We, we know our dirt. But 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things become new. So are, are you a new creature if you're born again? You, so we have this treasure in earthen vessels, guys. You're, you've got the new birth. You've got righteousness. You're, you're holy, okay? But you can't get into Revelation of verse 17 without acting on verse 16. Have you ever read verse 16? It says, wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. You can't identify yourself after the flesh and move into your new creation identity. You can't, you can't, you can't, you and I are supposed to be new, we're supposed to be New Testament ministers that are mining the new creation potential out of people. In order to do that, you gotta see past their dirt. Come here, Joshua, real quick. Jump up here. So this is Joshua Bartlett, good friend of mine. He, I love him. He's an awesome man of God, awesome leader, awesome husband, father now, praise God. Um, and, and, and so uh, if, I'm, if I'm gonna help, if I'm gonna help Joshua, or if Joshua is gonna walk in his new creation potential, Okay, uh, have you ever made a mistake or two in your life? Just one or two. Okay, you, you, do, you, have you had, do you have any weaknesses? Oh, no. no I, I'm, I'm going to bring Emily up here next. And right. <laughs> she'll tell me. <laughs> but but we all, how many of you know we all have weaknesses? We all have flesh. Okay, listen. In, in order, for, in order for, for us as New Testament ministers to help people achieve their new creation potential, we have to see past their dirt, okay, and, and, and see them after the spirit and, and, and prophesy over them after their spirit. To know them, not know them after the flesh or their weaknesses, their failures, but to know them after the spirit. Listen, this is what happened with Jesus. He saw the treasure in Joshua. He saw the treasure like his mom and dad did. And I talked, I knew his dad very well. And his dad at one time told me, pray for Joshua. Because <laughs> basketball was his God and other things. And, and he said, pray for Joshua. But his dad and his mom saw past the dirt. And more importantly, Jesus saw past the dirt, saw past his mistakes, saw past all of his failures, saw past all of his you know, pursuits that were, that were not godly. And, and they, saw, they saw the treasure. They, they looked past his dirt. And, and Jesus, Jesus loved Joshua enough that he, that he paid the price. And he bought the field to get to the treasure. Amen. 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 <laughs> Give Joshua a good hand. I love you, man. Love you. And for joy over it, he sells all to purchase us. And this, guys, this is a joyful, not a reluctant purchase. He had no reluctance to purchase us to himself as his bride. And most of us, we view ourselves through the glasses of some success or failure or weakness or some natural attribute or gifting or title or position in life. And we value ourselves accordingly. But guys, Jesus doesn't define us 
by our mistakes. He doesn't define us by our failures. He doesn't define us by our successes. He defines us by the price he was willing to pay for us. That's what makes us valuable. And all of that stuff that we value ourselves by, it's faulty performance-based identity. Jesus redefines us by the price he's willing to pay for us. The, the, the value of something is defined by the price somebody's willing to pay for. You, you could say your house or your car is worth something and you can get comps and everything else, but you know what that, you know what that thing is really worth? What, what someone will pay for it. The price, guys, the price he paid for you, the price that he paid for you. He saw past my big nose and my size 12 shoes and, and, my, and all my dirt. <laughs> he saw the treasure and he bought the field to get to the treasure. He valued me. He saw me, he, he, he sold, paid for everything so, so, that, so that I could be one with him. And who am I to, def make, to define myself in another way? Amen. Guys, he values you that way. That's, how, that's the price that was paid for you. You're the treasure, you're the pearl. And he considered he considered the purchase trading up. Wow. You're not defined by, what you, by your mess ups. You're not defined by, I, didn't have a, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. You're not defined by any of that. You're defined by the price that Jesus was willing to pay for you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're a marvelous creation of God. God did not mess up with you. Do you see this? Do you see this? Does your, does your soul know this right well? Guys, I'm telling you, this is the key. This is the key to you, you, you breaking out of this mentality of a, this orphan mentality, this slave mentality. Won't you stand up together with me? Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for you and me and, and the Father gave what he valued most, his only begotten Son because he saw the value in you and me. The merchant Jesus was seeking beautiful pearls. We don't search for things of no value. He searched for us. He sought us. He purchased us with his own blood because he valued us and saw us as a beautiful treasure. How do you see yourself? Put your hand on your heart. And say, Father, I'm not an orphan. I'm not, I'm not a slave. I'm a son. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You, I, you, you made me with skillful hands. I, I am not a mistake. I'm not second class. I, I, I'm a beautiful treasure. I'm a valuable treasure. I'm worth the price that was paid for me. You valued me, Lord. Help my soul know that right well. In Jesus' name. Now I'm going to pray for you. Father, I just break off at or every orphan mentality, every, every slave mentality. And Father, bring us into revelation that we're sons of God, that we're, we are fearfully, wonderfully made, that our souls know that right well. We're... we're we're good, we're great stuff, beautiful stuff, awesome creation of God. You did not make a mistake with us. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Praise God. Love you guys.